All right, everybody, here we go. Big announcement you've been waiting for. This fall, we are starting community groups. This is gonna be a transition from our current learn group system where before with learn groups, our staff actually placed you into a group. And part of the reason we did that was because uh, we really wanted to uh, have everybody be able to experience the full diversity of our congregation, both racially, uh, generationally, socioeconomically. And so we were intentional about setting up groups to be able to, to, to have the full flavor of our congregation in each and every group. However, one of the things that we noticed was that, uh, that there's a, a community element here that we, we really needed to focus on. So that's what we're doing with community groups. One of the main differences with community groups is you get to pick your group. We're gonna have uh, uh, several different leaders and at the end of the summer, you're gonna know who all the leaders are, where they're gonna meet, when they're gonna meet. We'll come back to that in just a minute. And then you actually get to pick which group you want to be a part of and, uh, and who can be, you can sign up with, with other individuals together. And the whole goal of this is that we want to be a church where everybody can be real, where everyone can be transparent, everybody can, can actually study God's Word with a level of transparency that not only feels real to you and I, but it feels real to a guest as well. Now. Here's a couple of other shifts that we're looking to make with community groups too. One is we're really encouraging our group leaders to lead groups that meet outside of the building. See, if we want to be a church that is, that, that is made up of disciples who make disciples, if we want to be a church that, that is reaching our community, then we've got to make sure that we're providing a place for our community to go. And the truth of the matter is that many people that live close to us are not interested in coming to a strange place on a Sunday morning to sing songs they don't know and to listen to some loudmouth preacher that they've never met before. Don't worry, I'm talking about me. It's not offensive, it's okay. However, they might be willing to go to your house. They might, be, they might be willing to respond to a personal invitation of, of yours to, to, to meet with a small group of people that, that you know and trust. See, by having these groups in, in homes or maybe even in restaurants, we open up the, 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 the way in which we can invite other people into these groups. Now, along those lines as well, we also want to encourage our group leaders to, to host groups that are meeting at different times. Like for example, there may be a group that meets on a Sunday morning at the church building and that's fine, but there may be a group that meets uh, on a Tuesday in, in someone's home or on a Thursday at Panera or maybe even on Sunday morning down at Rudy's. Another thing that we're, we're looking to do here in order to make this really appealing for those who aren't already connected with the church is we're gonna have uh, some groups that everybody's invited to, but we're also gonna have men's groups and women's groups that are available for people to be a part of. You get to choose what kind of group you wanna be a part of. You get to choose who you're gonna be in the group with. You get to choose who your leader is, and you get to be a part of a community that's going to, to be focused on discipleship, focused on being a disciple who makes a disciple, focused on getting into God's Word, focus still on valuing the diversity that we we have in our congregation and, and those that we want to reach out to in our community we you have the opportunity to choose all of these things now and I can't wait to see how community groups transform our church as the Houston First Church of God but also how these groups are going to change transform our communities how they're going to transform the places where we live and, and the apartment complexes in our neighborhoods like these groups are going to transform the way that we see others that are not yet connected to the church and it's going to transform how we see who we are and how we can make an influence for the kingdom of God
Good morning guys, welcome back to Houston Fair Church of God. We are excited, we are happy, we are looking forward to worshiping our God together. Uh, I do hope that you are just ready. It's 11 a.m. and we just we just want to worship our God together. Uh, even though we might not be at the building, it's okay. Wherever you are, uh, you know, it's time to wake everybody up. Tell them to come worship with you. Uh, we're going to do sort of like an acoustic session today. Uh, and it's going to be amazing because we're going to be praising our God. We're going to give him everything that we have in our hearts. Uh, and it doesn't matter where we are. You know, as long as we, uh, we are united together, give him in praise. You know, he will be in everyone's heart. Let's, let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear God, thank you for allowing us to be here together this morning is amazing you are awesome lord thank you for allowing us to 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 come together virtually once again and to give you praise and glory uh we come to glorify your name that is that is the only thing that we want to do we want to glorify your name tell you that you are the greatest that there is nobody like you lord that you are the only true god thank you lord for being good to us for giving us love and for allowing us to 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 be here lord in our houses, uh, worshiping your your name. Thank you for keeping everybody safe. Please receive this sacrifice of praise, Lord. Uh, each song that we're going to be singing, Pastor Tim, whenever he brings a message, everything that we do, we do it for you, Lord, because of you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. This first song is called Mighty to Save. Sing loud. This is for the Lord. He is worthy of all praise. Here we go. Thank you. 
Awesome God that we have. Couldn't you agree? It's amazing just to be praising His name. Uh, he's mighty to say, and He's our God. Amen. Should be made for those who love. 
one day everybody will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Soon the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you. Praise God. I am so thankful for worship this morning. It is so good to sing together. Uh, let me just say as well, thank you to everyone who has been praying for, for me and for my family. We are so grateful. Um, Beth and the kids have all been tested and their test came back in negative and I am really excited to be able to say as well that as far as I know, no one else from the Houston First Congregation has had any symptoms of anything. And so I'm, I'm just really thankful because that, that, that tells me that what we're doing in the building is working. And um, I, I'm thankful that the social distancing efforts that we are putting forth are, are making a difference and are making it possible for us to be together and to worship together. I know I'm not there in the building with you right now, just as an extra measure of, of safety and, and confidence there, if you will. Uh, but uh, I, I feel so, so good about our plan moving forward and how uh, we can worship together in a safe, safe way. And so again, Thank you for praying for me and for my family. Uh, it has meant so much to us in, in this, this, these last couple of weeks in particular. And the way that you've just poured out your love to us has been just amazing. So thank you from the bottom of our hearts, really. Thank you very much for all that you have uh, been doing for us. Today, I am particularly excited because we are going to be starting a new sermon series called Wholehearted. Uh, and this whole series is going to revolve around uh, King Amaziah of Judah, uh, of who uh, in his life we, we learn about in 2 Chronicles chapter 25. So if you have a Bible with you, I want to encourage you to go ahead and turn in your Bibles now to 2 Chronicles chapter 25. And uh, starting this week and for the next couple of weeks, we're going to look into the life of King Amaziah. There are some very peculiar ways in which uh, he is described. And there are also some very peculiar things that he decides to do. And I believe that we have a lot that we can learn today in regard to our relationship with Jesus uh, that we can learn from Amaziah that he's teaching us about how to walk with Jesus, how to, to go with him in, in all that <clears throat> that we're supposed to be doing. Um, one of the things that I am uh, particularly challenged by in our world today, not, not even really in the world today, but even, even in the church, you know, in the church as a whole, is that um, it's, it seems very possible that we can uh, claim a life with Jesus, that we can claim the forgiveness of our sins, that we can uh, claim uh, the presence of God's Holy Spirit in our lives, yet at the same time, there, there seems to be this pull on us, whether it's from the world or just from our past or just from our flesh, however you might want to say that. I notice even in myself here, right? Like, like I, I, I claim to be walking with Jesus, yet there's this, there's this pull on my life. And, and, and not only just toward temptation, because we all know that, that even as we are seeking lives of holiness, even as we are seeking to, to live lives of just, just absolute devotion to God, we know that temptation is, is always going to be there to, to try to kind of knock us off of where we are and, 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 and try to, to, to um, bring in um, a division within our relationship with Jesus and try to sever that relationship. That's what I was trying to say. Try to sever that relationship there. And so we know that those temptations are out there. But, but what I'm getting at is, is it seems like even beyond just temptation towards sin, 
sometimes as we are pursuing this life with Jesus, it seems like there are these, these other things out there that are also pulling on our lives that, that sometimes may, may come from our history, may come from sort of old ways that we've done things, or uh, maybe just other influences that we have in our lives, other goals that we have in our lives. And because of those other influences and other goals, we, we, we claim a life with Jesus, yet we're, we're also not entirely with Jesus either, right? And, and what, where we end up going with that is that we, 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 we have lips that say Jesus, but we have actions that say something else. And um, I, I guess I'm even noticing, particularly in the way that our world is managing some of the the tensions of our culture today, uh, whether that would be in regard to race or um, politics or or any number of things, really, um, we 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 sometimes, and not just in regard to to these things, but but I've I've noticed it even in regard to these things, is that sometimes we we, we claim Jesus. Uh, but then the, the the actions that we carry out don't exactly reflect Jesus, and so then it just kind of leads me to wonder, like, what do we what do we do with that? What do we what do we do as Jesus people who are claiming the name of Jesus and claiming the the influence of God's Holy Spirit in our lives, yet the actions that we are portraying are not always representative of what Jesus' actions would be, right? So what do we? What do we do with that? What, what do we do if we might recognize that in others? What, what do we do, more than importantly, if we recognize that in ourselves? What do I do if I recognize that my actions are not exactly lining up with, with what I am claiming about who Jesus is in my life and how God's Holy Spirit is to be at work in my life. And so uh, starting today, we are going to begin this sermon series called Whole Hearted, which is a, a way to look at like what would it look like for me to like, live a, a life that was absolutely congruent, right? That, that not only claimed the name of Jesus, but followed Jesus with everything that I have and all that I am. Like what would that look like. And I believe that King Amaziah and the life of King Amaziah have some things to teach us about what this could look like for us. So let me pray and then we'll get started here into Second Chronicles chapter 25. Lord God, we thank you so much for um, your great love for us. We thank you, Lord, for your presence with us even now. I thank you, Father, that um, that, that you are speaking into our lives here today, right now. Lord, help us that we would hear from you. Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth would be yours and yours alone, God, that your message would be proclaimed in this place. And that, 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 that more than anything, God, that, that we would not just, not just hear your word, but God, that we would find a way to do what you are calling us to do, that we might glorify you in our obedience, in our response to your word. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so 2 Chronicles chapter 25. Let me read for you verses 1 through 4. And it says, uh, Amaziah was 25 years old when he became king. And he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother's name was Jehoadan. She was from Jerusalem. He, Amaziah, Amaziah did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, but not wholeheartedly. After the kingdom was firmly in his control, he executed the officials who had murdered his father, the king. Yet, he did not put their children to death, but acted in accordance with with what is written in the law in the book of Moses, where the Lord commanded, parents shall not be put to death for their children, nor children be put to death for their parents. Each will die for their own sins. Now, um, this verse, verse 2, is what absolutely caught my attention and I, I could not 
get away from it, right? He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, but not wholeheartedly. What does it mean to do what is right in the eyes of the Lord, but not wholeheartedly, right? I mean, obviously Amaziah was doing, I, I guess what could be described as some good things, right? He, even though he did execute the people who killed his father, which by the way, uh, they killed his father because he killed the son of the priest, um, which might also be looked at as kind of a bad thing, but we won't get into all that right now. Um, but he, he killed the individuals who, who killed his father. I suppose that's justifiable eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, life for life kind of, kind of mentality there. And I suppose it was good that he didn't kill their children in light of the law. And, and so what that means is Amaziah did have an awareness of the law uh, and did have an awareness of what it was to, uh, to follow God's law and to uh, do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Yet it says that he did not do what was, what was right in the eyes of the Lord wholeheartedly. Now, when I, when I first read that, like, I think of like, what does it mean for me to do something wholehearted? And, and for me, obviously, I, I'm kind of a passionate person, right? I get kind of excited about some things. And so for me, when I think of wholehearted, I think, okay, well, I'm going to do this like with all of my heart, with all my passion, with all my energy, with all my emotion. Like, I'd like to think that I preach wholeheartedly, right? Like I give everything to it, like all of my energy, I give my sweat, I give my, my everything into a sermon. And, um, and so that's, that's kind of what came to mind. Like I give my whole heart in, in doing that more of a passion, more of an energy, more of a, a feeling, more of an emotional kind of, of thing there. Um, however, and, and again, I'm not one to, to go in and, and sort of break down um, the original text and those kinds of things. However, uh, there are two words that make up this, this word for wholehearted. Um, one, which is, is in fact the word for heart. And, uh, but, but as we understand this word, uh, not only in Hebrew, but also in Greek, uh, it is not always just, just the, the, the term for the physical organ inside of our chest. But really, your, the heart is what is what is central to you, right? Your heart is central to your body. And so anytime you refer to something as, as the heart of something, right? Like even the heart of Texas, um, uh, that, that, is, that is that which is central to that thing. And so uh, here, um, the heart is referred to as what is central to Amaziah. Now, the other word there is actually in the King James is actually, uh, I believe it's in interpreted as perfect, uh, which also has the connotation of completeness, right? It's, it's wholeness, completeness, and it is, it is at peace, right? So nothing missing, nothing broken, nothing, um, n nothing ajar, right? And so this is the understanding here. It's, so it's not necessarily that I give all of my passion, but it is, it is that that which is central to me is complete and whole and at peace. There is nothing missing, nothing broken, nothing ajar. And what, what verse 2 is saying here of Amaziah is that while he was doing what was right in the eyes of the Lord, there was something central to him that was not whole. There was something central to him that was not um, that was not perfected, was not complete, was not at peace, right? And we find um, even in verse three that for Amaziah, where his heart was was not at peace, was in regard to control. Now, watch this here, because this is what's interesting. So. If, if Amaziah was doing what was right in the eyes of the Lord, but not wholeheartedly, what that means is that while at one time he, he at the very same time that he's doing what's right in the eyes of the Lord, th there is also this other thing that is happening, right? And so, um, so there's this, this, this conflict, there's this division within him. There's this, there, there's that which is not complete, that is not at peace. In other words, these, there are these two things that are, that are kind of, uh, 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 uh pursuing uh, his heart at the very same time. One of those things is to do what is right in the eyes of the Lord. However, we find in verse 3 that the other thing is for his control. You see here that, that when Amaziah 
felt the firm control of being the king, then he began to make some decisions that, um, while they may have been in line with God's word, were also in line with him maintaining control there in Judah as the king. See, when, when your heart is divided, you don't really have a firm grasp on anything because you, you're always going two directions at the same time. And there's going to come times in our lives where this, this division, even for Amaziah, we're going to see um, starting next week, we're going to see where because he has this divided heart, he, he was going after God, but not wholeheartedly. His heart was divided not only toward God, but also toward his own personal control. And what we're going to see even next week is that, that when your heart is divided like that, there's going to come a time where you are going to have to choose one way or the other. And many times that doesn't leave you feeling peaceful and it doesn't leave you feeling whole and it doesn't leave you feeling complete. In fact, it leaves you feeling fractured and it leaves you feeling stressed and it leaves you feeling exhausted and many times depressed. See, church, I, I wonder if part of the reason that we are experiencing some, some of this internal conflict within ourselves on a daily basis. I wonder if it's because while we are striving to do what is right in the eyes of the Lord, we're not doing so wholeheartedly. It makes me wonder if, if part of the reason why we're, we're dealing with the, this, this, this lack of inner peace, this lack of, uh, or this, this, this presence of frustration, maybe, maybe part of the reason why we are struggling in our lives sometimes, even though we claim to be Jesus followers, maybe it's because we're not actually following Jesus wholeheartedly. Maybe it's because just like Amaziah, our hearts are divided. And while we are trying to go one way in following Jesus, we are also going this other way, which does not exactly reflect that. See, Amaziah's heart was divided by control. And when you're a king, control is actually a good thing, right? Like you, you want your king to have control. Otherwise, you're going to have anarchy and nothing's going to go the way that it's, it's supposed to, right? The point is, though, that good things aren't bad. Good, good things are, are, are like control is not a bad thing to have, but good things aren't supposed to divide your heart right? There's a lot of things that can divide our heart. Control divided Amaziah's heart. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, but then control also divided his heart. So he, what didn't, he, he didn't serve God wholeheartedly. See, there's actually a lot of good things that aren't supposed to divide our hearts either. In fact, Jesus, Jesus spoke about this in, in, in what could be described as, as some pretty tough ways, right? In, in Luke chapter 14, verse 26, it says, Jesus says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brother and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Why would... Why would Jesus say that? Like, why would, why would Jesus go that far with it? Like, like, why do we have to hate our father and mother? Why do we have to hate our, our own kids or our spouse? Like, Jesus, what are you, what are you talking about? What in the world? In fact, okay, let, let me make this a little easier for you. In Matthew chapter 10, verses, uh, verse 37, uh, it says, Anyone who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So that I, I guess that makes it a little bit easier there for you, right? Because it, it's not telling you to, to hate, uh, but really what Jesus is telling his disciples here is that he has to be the number one. Like, we have to love him more than anything else. Like, like, we have to do what is right in the eyes of Jesus wholeheartedly. There, there can't be a division even in regard to the way that we love our families in our own lives. Like, we have to love him with everything that we have. No holding back at all. Because the only thing that's worth your whole heart is your whole life. 
And Jesus is the only one who can give us that life. Think about this now. The only one that we should ever give our whole heart to is the one who can give us life. Otherwise, if we give our hearts in all these different directions, what we find is that life is actually being stolen from us. Let me show you what I mean. In John chapter 10, verse 10, it says, The thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy, but I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. See, whatever divides our heart from God, the enemy will use that to steal life from us. But a wholehearted devotion to Jesus not only gives us life, but gives us full life, gives us that complete life, gives us that peaceful life, gives us that perfected life. Do you see this? Like, like when we actually give everything to Jesus, he gives us that wholehearted devotion and love. Like we are not able to love God fully on our own. It is only when we submit ourselves to Jesus that we experience that wholehearted love for us that he has in order that we might be able to reflect that wholehearted love back to God. You see that? See, the irony is that our desire for control will ultimately control us and lead us away from Jesus. Matthew 10 verse 39 says, whoever finds their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for my sake will find it right? So, so think about this then. What else has your heart, right? Like, I, I, it, it would scare me to death to think that someone might describe me as someone who does what is right in the eyes of the Lord, but not wholeheartedly. I've got to ask myself, is there anything else that has my heart? Like, for example, like, um, well, what you need to think about is what are those things that you would say on one hand, yes, I follow Jesus, but then I kind of also do this other thing too, right? Whatever that other thing too is, that is what's causing your heart to be divided. So like, for example, maybe in your career, right? You might say, oh yes, I'm, I, I, I do what is right in the eyes of the Lord, but sometimes with my work, I just have to do a couple of things that Jesus might not really be happy with. Or, uh, I do what's right in the eyes of the Lord, but I will do whatever it takes for my family, even if that means that I have to fudge the lines a little bit. I will, I, I'll do what is right in the eyes of the Lord, but I'm going to be successful. And if that means I got to break a few, few rules to get there, then I'm going to be successful. I'm, I'm going to be in control or I'm not going to fail, right? What, what, whatever those things are, right? If we say, yes, I follow Jesus, but then there's these other things I do, then our heart is divided. And one of these days, like the enemy is going to make us choose. Like we're going to find ourselves in situations where we're going to have to choose that we're either going to follow wholeheartedly uh, Jesus or we're going to go this other way. And if our hearts are divided, more often than not, we're going to end up going the wrong way. We can't allow ourselves to be there, right? I mean, this, this shows itself in a, in a lot of different ways, even in regard to just some personal habits we have, right? Well, I, I do what's right in the eyes of the Lord, but I, I don't mind getting drunk sometimes. I do what's right in the eyes of the Lord, but I lose my temper and I let anger get the best of me. I do what's right in the eyes of the Lord, but I also have sex outside of marriage. I do what's right in the eyes of the Lord, but, but, but. You see how that makes your heart divided? And it keeps us from truly following Jesus in the way that Jesus died for us to follow him, right? So what is keeping you from doing what is right in the Lord, what is right in the eyes of the Lord, wholeheartedly. Like, think about it, right? Like, something caused you to want to follow Jesus in the first place. You, you saw, maybe it was just this desire to be forgiven of your sins. Maybe it was that, maybe there was some sort of promise of blessing or something like that. Whatever it might happen to be, something caused you to want to follow Jesus in the first place. And my thing is, like, like if, you're, if it was worth following Jesus halfway, why, why wouldn't it be worth following Jesus all the way? Because the truth of the matter is, Jesus does not accept halfway disciples. 
Either you're going all the way with Jesus or you're going no way at all. Like, like that's just the only thing that he offers. You're, you're either giving your whole life to him or you're not giving your life to him. See, the truth of the matter is when, when, when the Bible here describes King Amaziah as doing what is right in the eyes of the Lord but not wholeheartedly, what that means is that in essence, he really just wasn't doing everything that God wanted him to do. He actually wasn't doing everything that was right in the eyes of the Lord. Now, the bad news is that we've all fallen short, right? We've, we've, we've all had hearts that have gone away from Jesus. We've all had hearts that have turned from God. And the bad news is we, we, we've all been there. But the good news is that Jesus went all the way for us, right? Like even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us that we might know the forgiveness of sins, that, that we could be set free from everything that would divide our hearts. Like Jesus loved you enough to go all the way for you, even when you weren't even beginning to go any which way for him. If you know that Jesus is worth going part way, then, then how, what's holding you back from going all the way? What's holding you back from going wholehearted? See church, I think we need to, to rededicate ourselves wholeheartedly to Jesus. We need to accept the fact that, that yes, we are sinners and, and sometimes we have hearts that are divided and our hearts are not always wholeheartedly set on him. We've got to accept that we need a savior and that Jesus is that savior. We have to believe that when Jesus died on the cross, not only did he forgive us of our sins uh, in, in that, that first time that we accept him, but he also is able to overcome in us the divided heart that we are struggling with. Like this is, this is why the gospel is so important, not just for when you first get saved, but even as you continue to walk with him. See, even for those of us who've been walking with Jesus for a little while, but maybe not wholeheartedly, the same faith that it took for us to seek the forgiveness of sins is the same faith that is required even now that we would say to, 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 to God, yes, I accept that I'm a sinner and I accept that my heart is divided and I believe that by the blood of and, and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ that you can set me free from a divided heart. I believe by faith, Jesus, that you are able to do it. And then the Bible tells us that we are to confess we confess our sins and he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He's able to cleanse us from every division of our hearts that we might do what is right in the eyes of the Lord wholeheartedly. Get this now, because this, this is the good news. See, we can't do this on our own. We can't live wholeheartedly for Jesus on our own. No, we have to submit to him. And then he, by his grace, will empower us to be able to live wholehearted lives for him. Church, I want you to know, Jesus didn't die on a cross for us to just go halfway. He wants us to be wholehearted followers of him. Amaziah was a king who was not wholehearted for God. And we're going to see, even just starting next week, we're going to see how this really began to trip up his life. And I believe that, that we are actually experiencing some of these, the, these ways of being tripped up even now. We don't have to live tripped up. We don't have to live stumbling. We don't have to live going back to sin all the time. We don't have to live going back to old habits. We don't have to live in discouragement. We don't have to live in failure. We can live wholehearted lives for Jesus. What if today you decided to just Trust Jesus that you might have this wholehearted devotion to him as well. What is it that's holding you back? As we sing now, as we, as I want to go ahead and invite the, the worship team to, to come on back up and everything. As we sing uh, here in just a moment, I want you to really be considering, really be thinking about, really be praying through. What is it that's holding you back? It might not be a bad thing, but the enemy might be using it to divide your heart from Jesus. Nothing should be able to divide our heart from Jesus. Nothing divided his heart from going to the cross for us. In, in, in a love response back to him, we should do whatever we can to make sure that our heart is not divided either. Is there anything that's dividing your heart today? Is there anything that you need to confess before God and just repent 
believing once again that he's able to fill you with that wholehearted love for him. As we sing, why don't, why don't you do that? Even right where you are, confess your love to him. Confess your faith in him. Believe that he is able and you will see him make that change in your life. Let's sing together.
Father God, thank you for allowing us to be here together, united, Lord. You are awesome. You are our God. We give you praise and glory, Lord. We know that you are here in our hearts and that we can feel you. And I believe, Lord, that everybody that is watching, they can feel your presence in their hearts and their bodies, Lord. We are yours, Lord. Thank you. Receive this offering of songs, Lord. Thank you. We do it because you deserve this and so much more, Lord. You are worthy of our prayer. You are worthy of praise, Lord. You are. Yes, you are, Lord. Yes, you are. You are powerful, almighty God, wonderful. You are the great. Receive this, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hey Amen. I don't know about you, but I was I was feeling the spirit of the Lord as we were singing songs. Uh, it is amazing to know that God is here in the midst of all of this. And just because we're not in the building doesn't mean that we're not going to feel his holy presence. I feel it right here with me. And I believe that you do so as well. Uh, before we actually go, one of the other ways that you can, that we can actually, you know, worship God is through our giving. Uh, if you want to give online, you can go to hfcog slash give, uh, and you can select, uh, whichever phone you want to, uh, give to. Uh, also if you want to mail a, mail a check, you can write it to Houston Church, uh, Church of God. And then the address is 14400 Norwich Freeway, Houston, Texas, 77040, uh, and we're going to be blessing the kingdom of God. Uh, once again, I do hope that you, were, you, you had a great time uh, worshiping together. Uh, it, whether we do it online or at the building, we are we still will praise the name of the Lord. Uh, pray with me. Dear God, thank you for being good. Thank you for, for being faithful to us, Lord. Thank you for being our God. We love you. We want more of you, Lord. We are looking forward already for next Sunday. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus, for being good. Thank you for being our God. You are awesome, Lord. Receive the glory, Lord, to you. You are almighty God, Lord. Thank you for keeping us safe. And thank you for receiving this service. To, uh, we had a great time worshiping your name, Lord, because we felt your presence. And you are real. You are real, God. Allow this message to be shared with so many friends, Lord. That can it can that it can reach them, Lord. That Pastor Tim message can can touch can 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 speak, Lord, to their to their souls. Thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Have a great day, a blessed night, and everything that you're gonna do throughout the day. I do hope that you have fun uh, doing it, enjoy uh, each other's company. Uh, we have uh, fasting and prayer this coming Wednesday. If you will be a, if you wanna be a part of that, uh, go to a Facebook uh, page event. And then you can click the find, uh, click and find us the Zoom link. God bless you, everybody.
All right, everybody, here we go. Big announcement you've been waiting for. This fall, we are starting community groups. This is gonna be a transition from our current learn group system where before with learn groups, our staff actually placed you into a group. And part of the reason we did that was because uh, we really wanted to uh, have everybody be able to experience the full diversity of our congregation, both racially, uh, generationally, socioeconomically. And so we were intentional about setting up groups to be able to, to, to have the full flavor of our congregation in each and every group. However, one of the things that we noticed was that, uh, that there's a, a community element here that we, we really needed to focus on. So that's what we're doing with community groups. One of the main differences with community groups is you get to pick your group. We're gonna have uh, uh, several different leaders and at the end of the summer, you're gonna know who all the leaders are, where they're gonna meet, when they're gonna meet. We'll come back to that in just a minute. And then you actually get to pick which group you want to be a part of and, uh, and who can be, you can sign up with, with other individuals together. And the whole goal of this is that we want to be a church where everybody can be real, where everyone can be transparent, everybody can, can actually study God's Word with a level of transparency that not only feels real to you and I, but it feels real to a guest as well. Now. Here's a couple of other shifts that we're looking to make with community groups too. One is we're really encouraging our group leaders to lead groups that meet outside of the building. See, if we want to be a church that is, that, that is made up of disciples who make disciples, if we want to be a church that, that is reaching our community, then we've got to make sure that we're providing a place for our community to go. And the truth of the matter is that many people that live close to us are not interested in coming to a strange place on a Sunday morning to sing songs they don't know and to listen to some loudmouth preacher that they've never met before. Don't worry, I'm talking about me. It's not offensive, it's okay. However, they might be willing to go to your house. They might, be, they might be willing to respond to a personal invitation of, of yours to, to, to meet with a small group of people that, that you know and trust. See, by having these groups in, in homes or maybe even in restaurants, we open up the, 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 the way in which we can invite other people into these groups. Now, along those lines as well, we also want to encourage our group leaders to, to host groups that are meeting at different times. Like for example, there may be a group that meets on a Sunday morning at the church building and that's fine, but there may be a group that meets uh, on a Tuesday in, in someone's home or on a Thursday at Panera or maybe even on Sunday morning down at Rudy's. Another thing that we're, we're looking to do here in order to make this really appealing for those who aren't already connected with the church is we're gonna have uh, some groups that everybody's invited to, but we're also gonna have men's groups and women's groups that are available for people to be a part of. You get to choose what kind of group you wanna be a part of. You get to choose who you're gonna be in the group with. You get to choose who your leader is, and you get to be a part of a community that's going to, to be focused on discipleship, focused on being a disciple who makes a disciple, focused on getting into God's Word, focus still on valuing the diversity that we we have in our congregation and, and those that we want to reach out to in our community we you have the opportunity to choose all of these things now and I can't wait to see how community groups transform our church as the Houston First Church of God but also how these groups are going to change transform our communities how they're going to transform the places where we live and, and the apartment complexes in our neighborhoods like these groups are going to transform the way that we see others that are not yet connected to the church and it's going to transform how we see who we are and how we can make an influence for the kingdom of God I want to invite you to be a part of community groups. I want to invite you, maybe you're interested in being a community group leader. We're going to have a couple of trainings uh, throughout the summer to help you learn what it, what it would take to be a community group leader. And we would love for you to sign up even today. 
and maybe you don't want to lead a group, but you're interested in hosting a group. That would be awesome to sign up for as well. Learning groups have been great, but we really believe that community groups are going to transform who we are as a church. I invite you to be a part of community groups. I invite you to sign up as a leader for a community group. I invite you to be a part of these trainings, and together we're going to be disciples that make disciples that transform this world for the kingdom of God.